Hello, everyone, and welcome to NACDO's public webinar, Public Engagement That Counts. My name is Nicole Payne. I'm the program manager for our Bike Share and Cities for Cycling Networks here at NACDO, and I'll be moderating this webinar. For those of you who are new to NACDO, we're the National Association of City Transportation Officials. We're a coalition of almost 60 city transportation departments and transit agencies across North America. Our goal is to help cities share information and best practices that can make better places for people with safe, sustainable, accessible, and equitable transportation choices that support a strong economy and vibrant quality of life. Webinars like this one are key to NACDO's mission, bringing together city transportation departments, operators, advocates, and other interested parties to learn from each other helping cities develop city-focused design standards that meet urban needs and conditions, and providing a platform for leading in new voices in transportation. The topic at hand today is public engagement. Community buy-in is often a difference between a successful project and having to go back to the drawing board. Envisioning streets as shared spaces with all members of the community claiming equal share requires a balance of strategy and action. Adopting a planning with versus planning for philosophy provides a constructive platform for public views to be combined with professional expertise and creates better outcomes. So the question here today is, how can we think holistically about engagement to upend the traditionally top-down process of planning in favor of safer streets that work well for everyone? People walking, taking transit, biking, and driving. How can we how can we build a planning process that empowers all people to have their voices heard? As city staff and government, how can we work with communities so that big citywide goals like reduced traffic fatalities, access to plazas, parks, and open space, increased economic opportunities, faster, more reliable transit systems, safe places to, to bike or walk, don't get lost in shuffle? During this NACDO webinar, we'll delve into how engagement is deep-seated in Philadelphia's overall city strategy, New York City Department of Transportation's re-envisioning of on-the-ground outreach, and Minnesota Department of Transportation's use of data and cost accounting to expand outreach to traditionally underserved communities. The panelists we've brought together today will show us how they've operationalized the ever-critical role of inclusive planning. We have with us today Wafia Murray of the City of Philadelphia, Inbar Kashoni of New York City Department of Transportation, and Katie Kasky of Minnesota Department of Transportation. They're going to discuss the lessons learned on putting a new twist on engagement and the numbers behind the importance of keeping our communities informed and involved. Some quick logistics. We're going to leave a segment of 15 minutes at the end of the presentations for Q&A but you can begin sending your questions as they come up. Which brings me to thing number two, asking questions. On your on-screen control panel, there's a question box. Please type in your questions as you think of them and we'll try to get through as many as possible at the end. If you think of a question after the fact, write it in anyway and we'll, we'll try and get it answered at the end or we'll connect you with the appropriate speaker after the call. And yes, we will be releasing the recording and slides from this webinar on our website in the next few days. NACDO will be hosting webinars like this on an ongoing basis, so please check out our website at www.nacdo.org. With all that said, type your questions into the question box on the control panel and let's get started. Lafia? Hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Nicole. Um, my name is Wafia Murray. Um, I work here at the City of Philadelphia's Office of Transportation and Infrastructure Systems, and I manage the Better Bike Share Partnership. Um, the goal of the Better Bike Share Partnership is to um, incorporate equity within bike share systems and to spread best practices nationally. Uh, so I'll start off by just talking a bit about um, us here in Philadelphia. So with our Indigo Bike Share Program, we what really helped us to be successful is that we incorporated equity from the very beginning. Um, the main tip that I can give with giving doing community outreach is to do it early and often. 
Um, you always want to help people feel included from the very beginning, and that's what helped us with our Indigo program through programs such as our Indigo Ambassador program and our cash immigration option and discounted membership passes. All those those ideas were help were created with the help of the community, and we continue to keep them involved throughout the whole process. Um, and you'll hear more about other cool best practices such as that from our other panelists. Um, but um, the main thing I want to just start the conversation off by saying is that um, community outreach is very important. Um, we It's not only helped us with our Indigo Bike Share program, but using the best practices of community engagement and involving them in the process has helped us through um, like our bike network planning events, um, events like Philly Free Street. Um, it's really been a driver for us here in the city. Um, so yeah, just keep, keep in mind to just do that outreach early often in the beginning and I always kind of look at it as a theory of thinking about someone planning something in your own backyard. If you if someone was planning to do a project on your block or on your street, wouldn't you want to be included in that process? So keep that thinking in mind as you all plan um engagement process with the community. It it may feel like a lot of work in the beginning, but once you build that system of trust and that system of open communication where, you know, the city this the city understands the needs of the community and the community understands um the goals of the city planning, it really helps to make that process streamlined and you have best practices that you can replicate throughout other activities going on and going on. Um, so yeah, so that's basically kind of what I wanted to share from Philadelphia to start off the conversation. Um, and we'll now kick it over to Embar to share her best practices. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for the thoughtful intro, Afia, and thanks to NACTO for getting this conversation started. Um, I just wanted to begin by letting you know that we are taping this in front of a live studio audience. We've got our street ambassador group in the room. So if you hear coughing and laughing, we'll just make a present. Hey, yeah. yeah. Yay. All right, there they are. Okay, um, so as Lucia mentioned, my name is Inbar Kishoni, and I'm the Deputy Director of Public Engagement here at the New York City Department of Transportation, and I'm really excited to share what we've been doing the past couple of years. So as transportation planners, we're forced to think on big on issues that affect everyone. We think systemically, we think regionally, and we use data to make decisions, which means outreach is often thought of as just a box to check. It's an add-on that gets in the way of results or a tool to merely sell a project. But when done right, outreach can help you make decisions and engage the community in the process. Simply put, outreach is data. You can get a fuller picture of the what and the why, and it's critical, critical for community ownership, buy-in, and literacy of the built environment. If people know what you're doing, they'll know how to use your new design and you can experience greater success. All right, so in lots of transportation planning, the process goes like this. You've got an idea, you collect your data and you make a plan, you propose your plan to the community and the community is baffled. Not only have they never seen you before, they've also never thought about the thing you're talking about. It's like if you were proposing marriage to someone who had never met you before and you were like, will you marry me? I've got two years of data to show you that our marriage is gonna be really strong. You'd be like, okay, stalker, like get away from me. Okay, so let's flip this around. So first we wonder about the community. Then we date them, we get to know them and we build trust. Then when we propose our plan, they know who we are and why we're there and they can make an informed decision. So why has our outreach been so flawed until now? Well, it has a lot to do with the way we're asking for input. Come to our 6 p.m. meeting with no food and no childcare. We're having a charrette, which is like a word only planning school students like to use or know. Uh, vote on our proposal, give us your input, and my favorite, our meetings in the middle of the day. Next time you have a meeting like this, look around the room and see if everyone is paid to be there. If they are, then you're not reaching the community, you're reaching paid stakeholders. We're all planners, so we're into this stuff, but talk to your average friend and see if they've ever heard of a meeting like this. I like to check in with my friend who's a barista. If she wouldn't be able to make it to something like this, there's no way a mother working two jobs would be able to make it. But many of you are saying, hey, this method has gotten projects in the ground. Maybe, but it also sets us up to overvalue certain voices, like squeaky wheels. And it sets us up to battle NIMBYs. We need to move beyond the usual suspects in our outreach efforts. All right, so we tried to do this when we launched Vision Zero. We had a groundbreaking platform for community input in the form of online maps. The maps shared our data and allowed people to input issues they were observing from the comfort of their own home. Let's take a look. Wow, 
Uh, Park Slope, home to the famous Park Slope Food Co-op, and a whole bunch of writers named Jonathan, Saffron Foyer, Jonathan Ames, Lethem, Franzen, they really participated. Good job. All right, now let's compare this to Corona, Elmhurst, and Jackson Heights in Queens. This is a neighborhood with a high percentage of immigrants and non-native English speakers. Hmm. Are there really more problems in Park Slope, Brooklyn, than there are in Corona and Elmhurst? Our data says no. I mean, if you look on the map on the right and you look at those red lines, those are our high crash corridors. So what this is showing us is that online portals are limited by awareness of a process. <clears throat> and if you think of the Park Slope Jonathans, those are people who already have a voice. I mean, they've all been published. Okay, so we took it one step further. In 2015, we launched the Street Ambassador Program. This is a team of 10 who serve as an outreach arm that directly communicates with the public. Our program is designed to be equitable. Um, we're intentional about hearing from everyone. We actively seek out underrepresented groups and we speak the language most comfortable to who we're with. Over half the team speaks Spanish. Um, we're also flexible. Um, we work on weekends, morning rush, evening events. We literally meet people where they're at. So we set up our outreach stations where you are and we're respectful. Basically, we take the workshop to the streets. We entice people to participate by offering useful giveaways like reusable tote bags and super chic sunglasses. We collect data, data digitally through SurveyMonkey and in analog with maps and post-its. And we send you off in about 10 minutes. If you need more of our time, our team is willing to listen and hear you out. It's like the bookmobile of civic engagement. All right, so where do we go? Okay, so remember, we're dating the community. So we like to hit up classic date spots like bustling streets, movie theaters, parks, you know, uh, libraries, rec centers. Okay, wait, I guess this is less like romantic spots, but you get the idea. Uh, but what date night wouldn't be complete without a trip to Times Square? Just kidding, no real New Yorker goes to Times Square, just Batman and tourists. All right, so in our first full year of existence, our team supported 82 projects and spent almost 90% of the year on deployments. We spoke to over 32,000 people, and all those conversations got turned into usable data for project managers. From heat maps to in-depth survey responses to desire line maps, we crunched the data and we made it useful. So let's take a look at the Street Ambassadors in Action, the Harlem Bike Network. All right, let's begin with our participation numbers. What was our success in reaching the community back in the early days of Vision Zero? Okay, it's not so bad, but let's compare it to our super users. Ah, okay, well, we've got some work to do here. So we set up deployments in the community to solicit input directly from the people. If you'll notice, this project included some west side connections, which is why you see some upper west side locations in this map, for those of you who are familiar with New York City geography. So what did it look like? Uh, it was winter, so we had to concentrate on indoor locations where the people would be. We can't really set up outside when it's freezing. Um, so that includes like a shopping center during the busy holiday shopping season and libraries, which are some of our most trusted partners. Um, so just want to check in here. Now isn't the time to ask about bike lanes. We're not saying, do you want a bike lane? Check one. Yes, no, maybe. Um, now's the time to establish a baseline of understanding. So we asked people about their barriers to cycling and their interests. Um, in cycling. So often what we hear is that people are interested in biking, but they're too scared to ride in the street. Adults can only legally ride in the street, so you can see the conundrum. So we asked this in the form of an, a survey, um, and we also asked for local destinations and um, demographic data. Then we asked people where they currently ride, and we asked them where they want to ride. So that gave us something like this. Um, asking people where they ride and where they want to ride turns into a map like this. It gives us a full picture of neighborhood needs. So if you look at the map on the left, you'll see where people feel comfortable riding. And when you look at the map on the right, you'll see where people would like to feel more comfortable. What you're seeing is a real desire for east-west connections on 110th and 124th Street and a north-south connection to Central Park. Now, I wanna be clear, this isn't designed by committee. We don't just take this data and say, well, this is exactly where the bike lanes are gonna be. We analyze it like any other data set. We're still beholden to our design standards, our street widths, our signal timing. We still have to make a judgment call, but we're doing so with more data and more information. Street design time. So now it's time for our project managers and our design staff to get to work. All right, so remember this? 
Um, now it's summer and it's time for us to field test our plan. Did we get it right? Is it meeting the needs of the neighborhood? Let's check it out. So we hit up a youth market and some public parks in beautiful weather. So let's just check out this map again um, and we'll fill it in. So there's where we were. Okay, now in this case, it's very important to frame the project uh, because we wanna give people a sense of history and we want people to be able to plug in and see themselves in the project and give us valuable feedback. Um, so we had three boards to ground the project. What we know, we shared vital safety stats and design needs from a planner perspective outreach and planning, and often when we go out, we title this board what we heard, but in this case, so much work had been done beforehand that we needed to really like get a lot of information out there. So um, this is all of our research and outreach from before, and um, this board is important for help, helping people see themselves in the process and know where they're fitting in. And what we can do. This is where we illustrate what can be done in the near term with proposed connections and photos of treatment so people can know what to expect. We give design treatments a name so people can know what things are called and know the philosophy behind the design. And boom, we also have these boards in Spanish. Uh, then we also wanted to uh, take in some feedback via the lo-fi post-it board. Ooh. Okay, here's what it looked like in the field. Lots of info. Okay, so when you meet people where they are, you have real conversations with, with people who traditionally haven't been clued into the design process. And we hear stories of people's hopes and their fears. And we even hear from kids too, which are actually a really important part of this conversation. In New York City, once you turn 13, you're no longer permitted to ride on the sidewalk. So we don't want these kids to age out of cycling. It's very important for them to get their voice heard. So this effort overall yielded over 450 interactions, lots more than we would have reached in a workshop. And we really heard from people in the neighborhood. These weren't people who made a special trip to a workshop. These were people going about their lives as they lived them. We follow similar setups whenever street ambassadors are deployed for a project. And we also collect data from people who wouldn't have caught us on the street. In New York City, we don't have alleys, so all business operations need to go through the front door. Customers, deliveries, that's a lot of competing uses. So in order for us to best allocate curbside space, we need to get a sense of how the street operates throughout the day. So we ask the businesses themselves. We then make a chart that looks like this that gives us a sense of when the curb is most needed for deliveries. The darker the blue, the more businesses are using the curb. This helps us make a better decision about when and for how long a curb may need to be dedicated for loading. Um, and it allows us to have like a more surgical precision strike for our loading zone. We also uh, provide opportunity for participation beyond the street. Check out what this woman's got. Bing! It's a palm card that directs you to our online feedback portals. Oh, see, there's the website. Uh, these are project portals that replicate our original efforts with the Vision Zero input map, but are at a project-based scale. People can participate from the comfort of their own homes. And the difference between this and our original effort is that we're advertising them from the field. But I do want to point one thing out, is that we notice that participation on our portals is generally lower than what we get in the field. So we do our best to collect input while we've got your attention. And I want to be clear, this is more than just selling a project, and it's more than just getting a project in the ground. It's about collecting usable data for better decision making. And it's more than that. It's bigger than one project on its own. So remember this, do you think we're done with our efforts? No, we're not. Um, now that the community has a chance to know us, we can't ghost on them. Remember, we're dating, and we're trying to go on good dates, not bad ones. So we check up on projects that have gone in the ground via user surveys. We see if what we've done is working. When we have partners, like in our plazas, we can make sure they're holding up their end of the agreement to maintain the space and make it welcoming. And we can check level, level of comfort on our facilities. And in each of these instances, we thank you slash entice you to participate with a useful giveaway. These thousands of conversations have helped us understand what big picture issues don't translate to the everyman. <clears throat> Not everybody that you've met goes home and re reads design uh, standard manuals like we like to do. So we develop tools to explain design, um, to explain design and process issues. From a magnetic street mix board to bike shed, walk shed discs, to transportation equity Sudoku and a custom set of dominoes that educate about the bike network, uh, we can educate and engage while having fun. So instead of saying something like, 
do you want to learn about bike lanes? We say, hey, do you want to play dominoes? And people are like, oh, yeah. Um, and when we move from dating to a long-term relationship, we're able to say yes to community events that simply require um, some programming. And we always have a baseline of games for communicating difficult concepts. So if you dedicate a team to meaningful public engagement, outreach doesn't have to be an add-on. It can be a part of the regular modus operandi of your agency. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Katie Kasky, who is the Policy Planning Director at Minnesota DOT. Take it away, Katie. Thanks, Imbar. Um, my name is Katie Kasky, and I'll be talking today about how we use data at MnDOT to set up a responsive engagement strategy. Before I get into the details of our engagement data, though, I want to give you a little context about the overall project that I'm going to be talking about. This engagement effort was done as part of the joint update process for two of MnDOT's long-range statewide plans. The overall update process was about two years, but most of the engagement occurred in late 2015, early 2016. We had a multifaceted approach to engagement using a mix of in-person and online tools, and in total we heard from over 12,500 Minnesotans. Our goal for our overall engagement strategy was to be responsive. For us, that meant tracking who we were reaching and making adjustments to our approach as we went. It required a mix of data, strategy, and technology. One of the keys to being able to adapt our approach was to have a multifaceted strategy. Our guiding motto in developing our strategy was, however you want to engage, we have an option for you. We had everything from a one minute dot exercise at community events to all day in-depth discussions with stakeholders. We had a mix of online and in-person tools and a mix of traditional and new activities. Using a lot of different tools and types of activities allowed us to see which tools and activities best reach which populations. We were able to move resources around to make sure we were using the right tools and activities to reach the populations we needed to. I'll talk more about that later in this presentation. Another important part of having an adaptable strategy is the use of technology. Technology is what allowed us flexibility. We didn't force our engagement strategy to fit a certain tool. We figured out what we wanted to do and found the tool that allowed us to do it. However, that did mean managing a lot of different tools. It was more work for us, but reduced the barrier of participation for others. The piece that really made our responsive engagement strategy work though was the data. In order to know who we weren't reaching and to make adjustments, we first needed to know who we were reaching. Rather than ask for the usual information that we typically do, name, email, agency, or organization that you're representing, we asked participants to answer some basic demographic questions. The questions were optional, but over half of participants gave us at least some information. So what did we learn? Uh, before we made any sort of adjustments, we just analyzed the data from our more business as usual type of engagement, stakeholder meetings, all day forums, et cetera. What we found was that these traditional engagement activities reached a very specific subset of Minnesota's population. We called him Mike, but he could have just as easily been called Jonathan. Uh, just a side note here, Mike is a statistical creation. Any resemblance to an actual person is purely coincidental. I always make sure I add that disclaimer because we used to have a assistant commissioner that fit this description pretty well. Um, and it's not that Mike isn't important. There are a lot of Mikes in Minnesota, um, but there are also a lot more people. We didn't want to not hear from Mike. We just wanted to make sure we were reaching everybody else too. In order to reach the non-Mikes, we made some changes to our engagement strategy. Specifically, after analyzing the data, we identified some specific populations that were underserved by our traditional engagement efforts. We knew we needed to re a different approach to reach communities of color, women, people with disabilities, and those with limited English proficiency. We piloted a number of different tools and activities to engage with these communities. We collected the data uh, to know what worked and what didn't, and I'll share some of that with you all now. When it came to age, in general, the average age of our participants uh, were, was older than Minnesota as a whole. This was somewhat expected and okay because we weren't targeting children um, necessarily as part of this event. Uh, however, as the chart shows here, there are some big differences in terms of the ages that different engagement activities reached. And just a little chart orientation, um, on the far left uh, is the breakdown for Minnesota. Uh, the next bar over on the left is the total for all of our activities combined. 
And then the rest of the bars break out certain engagement activities. So you can just, and that will be true for all the charts that I show moving forward. Um, in regards to age, one lesson that we learned was that website and social media engagement doesn't necessarily equate to younger participation. In fact, the surveys we pushed out through Facebook ended up having the oldest participation of all, all of our tools. So while younger people may be using social media, they weren't using it to talk to us. Uh, we had much more success reaching younger populations by doing community events and, going, um, and engagement at workplaces. We probably could have been even more successful if we had done uh, more to target engagement events that we knew young people would be attending. When it comes to gender, we ended up with slightly more women than men participating. However, it's important to note that this, was the re this result came after extensive engagement targeted towards women. The only activity that naturally had more female participation than male was the surveys we did at community events. The rest skewed uh, male, and in some cases, heavily male. Uh, we used fa Facebook targeted advertising to help correct for this. Uh, that basically meant that we paid Facebook to have surveys show up in the news feeds of women Facebook users in Minnesota. Another interesting lesson we learned is that perhaps unsurprisingly, the transportation industry in Minnesota is very male dominated. Uh, you can see that from the stakeholder briefing chart, which was basically just meeting with our partners. This um, kind of helped, this data helped us drive home the point that talking to our partners isn't enough, that we do need to go um, reach out to a broader audience. In terms of race and ethnicity, we ended up with participation that closely mirrored the population of Minnesota. However, like with gender, this was after some extensive targeted engagement. Minnesota is a pretty white state, but our traditional participants were almost entirely white. To correct for this and to ensure we were hearing diverse perspectives, we employed a couple different strategies. Similar to what we did with gender, we used targeted Facebook advertising to reach Minnesotans with different ethnic affinities. Um, additionally, we partnered with community leaders and an organization called ECHO to run some of our event-based engagement at different cultural events and businesses in the state. This, is, this also included translating our surveys into Spanish, Hmong, and Somali, the three most commonly spoken languages besides English in Minnesota. And we conducted engagement in these languages. So this first chart shows the, kind of the breakdown um, by race, but the story is uh, also true for ethnicity. We also looked at where our participants were coming from, uh, from a geographic standpoint. Since we were updating statewide plans, we wanted to ensure we heard um, from a statewide population. We did a lot of traveling as part of our engagement effort, but we also used Facebook targeted advertising to expand our reach. While we didn't get participants from every zip code in the state, our participation closely aligns with the state's population distribution. Uh, you can see on the map, uh, for those familiar with Minnesota geography, the darker blue areas tend to align with our bigger cities. In general, collecting all this demographic data uh, about age, gender, race, ethnicity, and geography was really valuable in helping ensure all of our ensure our participation represented all of Minnesota. But it was also valuable because it allowed us to see if different populations within the states have different priorities for transportation, and they did. And this helped us write a better plan. So I wanna talk a little bit about cost, because in addition to who you reach, another very important consideration in developing an engagement strategy is how much it costs. Uh, to better understand this side of things, we did some analysis on a sample of our activities. Um, what this really helped show is the value of using new and different tools. So here are some examples of how much it costs to get each response, um, starting with some more traditional engagement methods. Uh, so for example, to send staff to attend one of our partners' existing meetings and get feedback, uh, that's the part that says stakeholder briefing, it costs us about $99 for each worksheet that we had completed. Putting on three all-day forums to gather input from some stakeholders costs us about $192 per worksheet. Now moving on to some of the newer things we tried, um, doing a DOT exercise at the Minnesota State Fair costs us about $1.40 per participant. Sending staff to the zombie pub crawl in Minneapolis to get feedback costs us about $24 per completed survey. Uh, working with ECHO to translate our surveys and schedule and staff events in um, the Somali community cost us about $61 per survey we had completed. 
our first round of Facebook targeted advertising, uh, which we targeted towards just all users in Minnesota, uh, cost about $14 per survey that was completed through that. And lastly, uh, spending, sending staff to a workplace to, um, to get feedback from employees cost us uh, about $129 per completed worksheet. So what we learned from all this is that engagement costs are all over the place, uh, anywhere from $1 to $200 per respondent. Uh, we don't think this means that you should only do the cheap things and ignore the expensive ones. Uh, different activities buy you different things. Um, you know, you have to take into account the duration of the conversation, the level of detail, the relationship you're trying to establish. Um, the key is just to pick the right tool for the job. Um, we use, so we use this cost data along with the demographic data to adapt our strategy as we went to be as efficient and effective as possible. Uh, and because people always ask, uh, we get kind of what's in our numbers here. Um, you can see some of our assumptions as well as what's in, in it is included. Um, the main disclaimer here is that these are planning level estimates. I wouldn't use them to make a project budget. Uh, they're just kind of roughly to show scale of different investments. And the other thing is that we try to make the assumption or the estimates as complete as possible. We wanted to know the kind of the true level of resources that's needed to do quality engagement. So really everything I just presented can be boiled down to one slide. And even more simply, our biggest takeaway is that using data and being intentional about what you're doing can help you get the most for your public engagement efforts. Um, it will help you hear from everyone, spend your resources wisely. Uh, and that's all I have. You can learn more at our uh, project website. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Wafia, Inbar, and Katie for um, really driving home the point that who you reach is really defined by what you're doing. So we're now going to um, move to our Q&A portion of this webinar. As a quick reminder, we're going to try and get through as many questions as possible. If you think of a question after the fact, write it in any way, and we'll try to get it answered at the end, or we'll connect you um, with the appropriate speaker after the call. Our first question, um, as a consultant that frequently works with municipalities on engagement contracts, um, a client who's a municipality sometimes says, this all sounds well and good, but it doesn't it cost a lot. What can um, the question asker say to them about return on investment and boots on the ground early and throughout? Uh, I'd say it probably is going to cost a lot more when you are going to have to go back to the drawing board. So you might want to take into account like revisiting and redesigning a project um, later on. I think that's something that's happened on our end when you put a lot of time and effort into a design and then you basically have to like throw it in the garbage and start from scratch. Um, that's just my two cents on it. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I think one of the things that one of our big takeaways is um, that people didn't, some, some decision makers don't necessarily understand the costs of the business as usual types of engagement. Um, you know, it's just been so established of a practice and, you know, to do public meetings and public hearings that we don't think about how much resources actually go into putting those on. And so that's part of what we tried to do for our decision makers and leaders was show what cost, what that cost versus some other options and what we were getting for it. And I think sometimes highlighting, highlighting the resources that, um, that go into the things that they kind of expect to see or plan to see um, can help you expand what they're willing to to look at in terms of engagement. Yeah, actually, I just thought of another uh, thing to piggyback off of that is that often the traditional strategies are only kind of set up um, in the wrong part of the process. So you'll have your idea set and then you're like, time for some outreach. Um, if you want to have an authentic um, engagement experience and you want your outreach to really help you uh, design a project rather than sell your project, if you move, even if you did a traditional outreach effort, if you really moved it to the beginning, you would have a lot of buy-in um, and you could actually use the feedback you're getting as um, data to inform your design rather than as like cherry picking things to support your project later on.
So our next question um, is about the New York City Ambassador Program. We're getting a bunch of questions, so I'm going to try to merge a few. Um, in bar, are the ambassadors paid? And can you talk a little bit about how you selected your team? And specifically, yes. did they come from a planning background? Oh, great question. This is one of my favorite things to answer. Um, yes, they are paid. Um, <laughs> And we're city government, so we have a civil service system, and I think other city governments have this, and state governments have this. And I'm only speaking from New York City, so I don't know what it's like in other places. Um, but um, often there's a city, uh, there's a hiring process with these different titles for, um, for different types of jobs. So... Just to answer the planning question first is um, when we were hiring our planning staff, um, what we noticed when with our applicants is there's a there's a very high barrier to entry. There wasn't a very diverse workforce that was applying for those jobs. Um, we were using a title called city planner um, that required a master's degree. Um, as planners, like we are all kind of nerds who have somehow found this field, and it's not a field that really recruits. Um, and goes to schools and tries to get people involved. So when we were launching the program, oh, P.S., a lot of planners are often kind of um, nerds who like to sit in the background and do designs and aren't necessarily like people who can go out and speak about their projects or sell their projects very well. So um, when we were launching this program, um, we went in with a different title um, that was kind of earlier in that civil service uh, title process. Um, which was the community associate title that took down our barriers to entry. Um, and we got a completely different workforce of people who were applying to our positions. Um, we were looking for people who are multilingual and had background in customer service or community organizing. Um, and again, not all planners have that background. And that's very important in this work when you are going to be going out and talking to hundreds of people a day and hearing lots of stories and try to like take this and turn it into data and turn it into um, just relaying what you're hearing on the streets and bringing it back to the planners. Um, so yes, just to answer that question. That wasn't a yes or no question. I guess. Oh, yeah. So, yes, you are both. Yeah. Sorry, hi, this is Wafia from Philadelphia. I just wanted to add on to that question. We also um, have a very engaged community ambassador outreach program here, and um, it is paid. And we often stay away, um, as Embar was saying, from kind of engaging like the super fans of bike share or biking, because oftentimes you want to have ambassadors that can connect with the subset of organization that you're looking to engage. So like with, for example, like with Indigo and Bike Share, we're looking to, we, we got, you already want to be able to engage those people that are going to bike anyway. You want to be able to figure out how you can connect with those that don't always look at biking as their first option or, or have those barriers that they're trying to um, assess. And also it's important when you're planning your community ambassador or any ambassador organization is to figure out what your overall goal is. Um, and a lot of times there are often leaders within the community that are doing a lot of the work already that you're looking to engage with your ambassadors on. So really doing that, taking that additional time to do that research to find those local community partners that fit into your message and have been doing this work already is good to keep in mind. Yeah, just to, um, to add on to that, uh, that's something that we're due at DOT as well. So what, what Fio was saying is very important about finding kind of the local voices and engaging those people who are already engaged. Because if you leave them out, you're not going to have a real conversation with the people um, who are affected by the project. Our next question is for Katie. You mentioned that different groups have different ideas about what should be planned. Did you re-engage these groups, reframe your plans, or do any other analysis based on this first analysis? Yeah, so we um, so a little more context on that is so we ha since we had such a rich data set of who we were reaching, we were able to kind of dive into the what we were hearing from the different respondents and start to see if there were differences between different communities. And we found that, um, you know, there was a lot of similar priorities for the future of transportation in Minnesota, but that there were some kind of areas that stood out where certain groups um, 
kind of rated one of our area, one of our priority areas higher than others. Um, and so that was really valuable for us because a lot of times the engagement data just gets all lumped together. And, um, you know, when you do have um, kind of, even if you have representative um, participation, you still end up with kind of a majority opinion um, if you lump it all together. So being able to tease some of that out was really valuable. And some of those, um, how we use that then is that we, um, you know, we were really cognizant about, um, you know, pushing for some, so I guess I should clarify a lot of what we were working on was an update to our policy plan. So we, you know, looked at some policy direction areas that maybe didn't rank high overall, but that were high for certain communities and those became more of a priority within our plan. And, you know, one area we could have done better with is to kind of close the loop um, with the different communities and individuals that we reached out to. We kind of posted our findings and posted information about how we used it on our project website. But, um, you know, I think, you know, whether or not the individuals we heard from kind of um, saw that as, as kind of a, a do better next time um, thing for us to take a lesson learned um, is that we should do a better job of closing that gap so people can really see how we used their or how their input influenced our planning. In bar, everyone wants to know about the games. Are they available in more detail online or some other platform? Um, you have to come and find us. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> we haven't, uh, we don't have anything online about them, but that's a really good idea. Um, so great idea. Yeah, we'll try and find a place. I think we might, you might be able to see them in like our Flickr, DOT's Flickr. I'm like, maybe if you go at the Summer Streets events, you could maybe see some more of the games. Thank you. Um, this is a question open to all panelists. How do you deal with the disconnect between what policy says and what people want for themselves? For example, policies in our cities focus on improving safety and reducing single occupancy vehicle driving. As an obvious but unfortunately real example, how do you push back on people who say that all they want is to be able to drive fast and freely wherever and whenever they want? Um, I'm sure my the street ambassador team has had this conversation a lot in the field, but I think it's all about grounding yourself in you know your personal comfort versus infringing on the rights of others. Um, I think we use a lot of empathy building in these conversations about putting yourself into other people's shoes. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's really about grounding. I'm trying to, I'm looking at the team to see if anybody's got a thing, experience from the field. Safety. safety yeah. Uh, David says safety. We often use our safety stats as like the background of uh, why we have to move forward with something. Personal mobility choices over safety, you know, it's a hard uh, argument to make against safety. And I would just add to that that there's a, um, you know, a certain piece of the conversation is, you know, you can have these broader goals for at the city or state level. It doesn't mean, you know, if you have goals for people to increase biking, walking, and taking transit, that doesn't mean nobody's ever going to drive alone ever. And so kind of having that open conversation about, you know, people still have different needs and still have different preferences. And um, we talk a lot about transportation options and making sure that we're investing in options and creating those opportunities for people to move the way that they want to. Doesn't mean that we're you know, gonna be forcing anyone to take the bus or bike or walk. But for those that do want to or are interested, we're creating that opportunity for them. And then I also think it's um, important to kind of frame any engagement you do with kind of what this is going to impact or what this can impact and, you know, not over promise that, you know, everything I hear from you as an individual is going to mean that that's what the plan's going to say or that's what the project's going to be. Um, and then also having the data about what you're hearing from other people can be really informative in that those types of conversations as well, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that not everybody has the same opinion as as they do. And so being able to say, you know, this is what I'm hearing from you and this is what we've been hearing from others can kind of show that whole um, kind of spectrum of input and kind of grounds the conversation a little bit more. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think our lo-fi post-it boards 
are kind of part of our setup where you can really actually point to something someone else said. That might have been the total opposite of what you just heard. Um, so people can kind of ground themselves in the bigger story. Our next question. Um, you, um, all of you all presented programs and activities that really um, diverge from the traditional 3 p.m. town hall meeting. Can you talk a little bit about how you got internal buy-in for these new activities? I can talk a little bit about that. And I think one important thing to note is we still did the traditional engagement too. Um, you know, there's a certain segment of the population that that's what they want, that's what they expect, that's what they've grown accustomed to. And so new and different things are good and can be really effective, but you still have to make that space for those people that like those traditional methods. And also I think it provides a certain amount of comfort um, for leadership when you say, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this as opposed to we're gonna do this instead of this. And I think the um, for us, a lot of our buy-in, um, we were fortunate our leadership was very supportive of us exploring new and different things. But part of that was, you know, we said we were gonna be collecting the data to kind of figure out what was effective and, and what was not and making adjustments as we went to make sure we were only doing the effective things. And so I think having that data and that knowledge about what works and what doesn't um, can, and to be able to present that to leadership can really help them buy into strategies they maybe otherwise wouldn't. Um, and I think for me, part of the way I got buy-in was um, I used to be a project manager in the bike program, and I was working on a community uh, network plan in a neighborhood that had consistently rejected uh, anything DOT brought to the table regarding bikes, um, because people really uh, see bikes as a signifier of change, um, that the streets are almost no longer theirs, even if... Um, you know, they've got people from the community who are using city streets. Um, so in this process, I think um, we had two workshops and I had gone to like multiple community events myself, basically field testing the street ambassador model before having the street ambassadors. Um, and it was a lot of work on my part because it was a lot of me being out there having conversations um, we also did like intercept surveys and with like prizes and all of those kinds of um, pieces of the puzzle. And when it came down to it, um, with all those conversations and everything, when we presented to the community board, uh, our network passed by one vote. And uh, that vote was from the chair of the board. And it was because she believed in the process. And that was like unheard of for that community board to actually say yes to one of our projects. And so um, she still kind of defends the, pro the process till this day. She's like hearing people's feedback, but she still likes the way we did it. And um, having something like that work kind of proved that this is a model that we could pursue. Um, so that kind of laid the groundwork for the future team. It was also, as I mentioned, it was too much work for me and too much work for our other project managers who were super busy um, and um, aren't necessarily multilingual. I speak another language that's incredibly unuseful, which is Hebrew, because everybody who speaks Hebrew speaks English. But um, but having the multilingual team, that was also like a sell for getting this off the ground. And just to build off of what Imbar was saying too, and I, something we found that I think is is a common thread here is, start everything as a pilot. If you're trying something new or different, frame it as a pilot. That's what, you know, people are comfortable with that. You know, it's less committal. It's not, you're not saying it's gonna be the perfect thing, but um, you know, and then and then don't follow through with it if it ends up going po poorly, but you can find some really good things that then can become permanent or new ways of doing business if you kind of start them as a pilot. And, uh, and just another thing to add is you wanna get cre creative about staffing. So <clears throat> the headcount for this team, this is like probably too much information of a backstory, but it came from when New York City changed our parking meters, um, the old school parking meters into muni meters. Um, a whole bunch of people's jobs who used to be meter maids, um, they got replaced by robots, like legit got replaced by robots. And so we had this headcount um, that existed in the city budget that, um, no longer had work to do. And so we had some iterations of some kind of 
pre street team thing. And then it became again clear that we needed people who could actually speak to the community and have customer service skills. And we reallocated that headcount. So for those of you who are in cities who are like modernizing and you have an existing headcount, just think about reallocating your um, staffing and um, you could potentially start something like this up yourself. Um, and I would just add that, I mean, when you think of like, I know the, when you think about the flexibility of community meetings, it really kind of goes back to the relationship building. You can even use, um, um, go off of your um, dating analogy and bar of how, you know, when you're starting a new relationship, it's part of that getting to know each other process. So that idea of coming together and figuring out when's the best time to hold a meeting, those conversations is part of the relationship building between the community and um, the organization that, that's looking to work with that community. So finding out, you know, what what the schedule of those community members are, what the needs of those community members are, what ideas and things are important. It's all It all goes into that initial kind of relationship building and eventually hopefully builds into that um, building of trust where you're able to like come together and figure out what best practices work better for you in that community. So just keeping that in mind of how, why that kind of meeting people where they are and finding a good time to schedule meetings is so important in that beginning conversation and relationship building. Thank you. Um, continuing on this um, conversation, um, in Bar and Wafia, could you go into a little more detail about the initial steps and retention strategies in building your ambassador program? Um, I can, I'll kick it off. So um, it's funny you mentioned retention. Um, we have actually a very, we have a very intentionally designed program that we're um, basically like a recruitment and um, like, like we try to build people up and then release them into the planning world. Um, so it's actually not always about holding on to people. It's about building their skills and moving them up the ladder. So we actually, um, I think of our former ambassadors as alumni. So they come in and as I mentioned, we kind of are able to draw in people from um, communities that are tend to not be represented in the planning world um, by seeking out different skill sets at the very start. Um, and so we bring people in, we build their skills, and the idea is to have those people become the decision makers of tomorrow. Um, so at this point, three of our initial 10 ambassadors have actually moved on into project manager roles at DOT. So they are now um, using all this uh, like kind of background to make decisions uh, as project managers. We had two move on outside of the agency. One is running his own street ambassadors in Boston. Um, we have some more alumni soon moving into um, the consulting field and into another agency at a high level, which I'm super excited about because um, we're starting to get our fingers um, in other city agencies to kind of like flip their model as well. Um, and then we bring in more people and train them. Um, that can be exhausting for our staff. So we've also looked into other um, staffing options. Um, this year was the first year that we participated in the City of Uni the City University of New York. I usually don't say the whole thing out loud. We call it CUNY. Um, they have a program called CUNY Service Corps, um, which are young leaders um, in college who are interested in doing good in the community and at large. Um, they're able to give us 12 hours a week. Um, they're coming from a very diverse background. I think um, almost all of them are either immigrants or um, their parents are immigrants. Um, so they're also speaking lots of different languages. Um, we have a curriculum for them um, where they're also being exposed to planning strategies, um, I'm a geographer, so there's lots of geography component in there, built environment stuff. Um, and we're hoping to recruit from that pool as well, eventually. So um, it's uh, building and pushing up the ladder and not just about uh, retention. Though I do, I will retain some people. <laughs> Um, I would say here um, in Philadelphia with our ambassador program, um, retention is is, is really, I, I mean, I wouldn't call it retention. I would call it they're invested. 
Um, so we have our ambassadors, even once they're finished their term of ambassadorship, um, they're still a part of the Indigo and the Better Bike Your Partnership family because um, they get feedback not only on Indigo programming, but other initiatives that they that they find important that they can get feedback on. So I think it really goes into your initial recruitment of ambassadors because when you when you look to recruit ambassadors, you want to find those leaders that are invested in the community and are invested in bringing resources to their community to help address barriers that their community faces. And so once you find someone with that investment, uh, once you have that investment, you know, you, you don't leave. It's, and, and also making it, making sure that on your half of being the, the program, the, the, the person on the side of programming is that you continue to create opportunities to keep um, those ambassadors invested. It's, it's the same even with community outreach. You don't wanna just go out in the community, do a program, do outreach. Once you get what you want, then you leave. Because that that's that's a that's a that's an issue because that's something that's happened for years and you want to work against that. So it's important to also create um, mechanisms where you can continue that outreach, both with your ambassadors or just you know the regular um, just everyday people that you touch within the community. So keeping them involved in um, other programs within your organization or, or even just keeping a lot of the community communication open so that if there are other resources that that come through your desk as working for the city we we receive a lot of other programs or a lot of other benefits that can be beneficial to those community members so even if it's a you know a newsletter or just checking in and calling them and passing along um passing along information um it's, it's important to keep those uh keep keep those connections with those with those community organizations even after their you know tenure with ambassador is done and i just want to put out there that the work that they do is really hard it is very hard to talk to hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, and so I think we should all just also give them props for like that work that can be exhausting physically and emotionally um, and build in kind of recovery time for that um, and room to communicate like freely with your team. Awesome. Thank you so much. Everyone, please give a virtual round of applause to our phenomenal panelists. Um, as a reminder, we'll try to get all of you all's um, unanswered questions answered by our panelists after this webinar. We'll be sure to follow up with you all here today and get those questions back to you as soon as possible. There are a number of great upcoming events and opportunities at NACTO, and we also have some great public and network-only webinars coming up. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, tune in for our Global Design Teams webinar from pop-up to permanent, transforming cities through interim interventions. This will be a lively discussion on engaging local communities in interim design interventions and the role of tactical urbanism in gathering public support for urban projects. We're also having a webinar on NACTO's new All Ages and Abilities Guidance on February 20th, 2018. So stay tuned, and if you're interested in any of these events and need additional information, feel free to send me an email at nicole at nacto.org. And with that, thank you all for calling in to today's webinar. As always, think through what resources and information you may want NACTO to host or develop in order to help you best address the bike share or community engagement issues in your city. We're all, we are wholly dedicated to supporting you all. I would love to hear from you, so please don't hesitate to reach out with ideas, questions, and comments. Thanks, and have a great day.